Good evening uh, to this uh, talk, uh, IAP talk with uh, Clark Conchusa, the President of the Parliament of Kosovo. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. It's a big honor for us and of course thank you to the Ambassador and to the whole group you brought with you and uh, our guests and our uh, visitors at the different uh, media channel we will transport and transmit uh, this talk. Uh, I'm particularly happy that you are here because I think um, with all the dreadful war in Ukraine, very often the problems, the issues, even the suffering of people in the Balkans, especially in Kosovo, are uh, overlooked and uh, not uh, regarded. Um, but I think we should not put aside what happened in the past, but also have a look into the future. Uh, personally, I visit very often uh, Kosovo, the last time it's uh, some half a year ago, uh, and I think um, Kosovo deserves more attention by the European public, by European politics and politicians uh, to go forward. Uh, of course, uh, if you look to Kosovo, you always uh, are reminded of what happened in the past, and I was there the first time, personally, when uh, it, it was in Kosovo, was still part of Serbia, uh, was uh, neglected, was the Kosovo people very often have been discriminated, and I visited Kosovo and I saw what happened uh, on very specific cases, I don't want to mention them here, but when we met uh, the later president and late president Rugova and we met uh, the Serb representatives and we could see how the then uh, regime uh, from Serbia mistreated the people of Kosovo and the interest of the Kosovo people. Now I think this talk is up to you of course Mr. President to look also into the past but I think the main issue should be the future of Kosovo and its citizen. How can, after all what happened in the past, reconciliation, cooperation, coexistence uh, be possible in Kosovo itself, but also in the whole region? So I think maybe uh, I want to ask you to start with some words and then we can come into a dialogue and if people also here in the room want to join, it, it is up to them. So my real question is, what future do you see for Kosovo in the region, in relationship, of course, also to Serbia, to other countries? Still, for example, there is no visa, libre, uh, visa uh, free traveling to European Union, but also not to Bosnia Herzegovina. And how do you see your past towards European Union, your European dedication? Maybe you start with some remarks and then we can continue the discussion again. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, dear <coughs> Hannes. I am very pleased to, to be here in this wonderful premises of the International Institute for Peace. And I would like to, to congratulate Mr. Svoboda at uh, being very much involved with the Balkans and in, the re in our region there and uh, always being close with even our challenges and problems we always had in the past. But also I want to thank you which you joined this, this uh, important discussion because uh, it has become really much more important after uh, the you know, developments that are happening after the Russian invasion against Ukraine. Because I think that uh, now, much more than ever in the past, a true leadership is needed, also in the European and international stage, in order to, let's say, uh, conclude and um, conclude a vision about Europe, but also about Balkans. Um, I would like to, let's say, explain a thesis which I had and to share with you some, some opinions on this regard. 
because I think that um, two earlier stages, two earlier stages were very important how they were concluded with um, a very visionary project of European leaders at the end of the 20th century and at the beginning of this century we live in. First, it was the intervention, international intervention to stop the war in Kosovo, to stop the genocide in Kosovo. And the second was this period of time from declaration of independence up to the opinion of International Court of Justice about Kosovo. If you take these two important steps, then you will see behind this a really visionary drive and force of a very well-defined project of international community, but especially of European Union and most important European countries. And they're, le le they're, they're brave, brave leadership who, who come together and they decided some important points but also red lines about the region, about Kosovo, about Serbia, about Western Balkans. So it was important because if you see what was happening in Europe and in Balkans in, during the 90s and, uh, and how it was concluded in 1999, then you cannot but applaud applaud this European effort and this international effort because we know what a mess Balkan was in 1991-1999 and what is the situation right now and especially 20 years from NATO intervention. There was peace, there was peace, there was stability, so we let's say entered from the stage of genocides, massacres, atrocities and, you know, crimes against humanities into a much more calm of, you know, cooperating with each other regardless of, of course, difficult challenges we have ahead and together and with each other. The second, the second important, let's say, vision in, uh, in unity, in, uh, let's say, in consensus, in consensus of European values was also this, how we managed together the independence of Kosovo and the legality of the process, conclusion of the legality of the process, and it took two years from, from the independence in 2008 to the decision of uh, International Court of Justice. And International Court of Justice concluded that there was nothing extraordinary in declaration of independence of Kosovo. Like, even I find this opinion of ICJ very revolutionary in the field of, uh, let's say, international law, because the opinion was as if, you know, there are no objective guidelines of international law. History, history builds the international law. People who fight for their freedom build international law. So that's why international law was international law of, let's say, 70 states, before 80 years, and then international law of 195 states today. It is because of this drive of history, this never-ending endeavor of, of people trying to build international law. You know. this, was the, th this is how I understood the, the, the essence of the opinion of, of ICJ, which was very emancipatory in, in a 21st uh, century Europe and uh, the world because um, I thought that it was very very important because it says that you know 
the representatives of the people gathered and uh, expressed the collective will of a population and there is nothing for forbidding this this act so it is it is allowed it it happens <laughs> so, and, and i think that it's very important because uh, because i i remember this this stage especially this 2010 i remember that um, our state institutions together with the most prominent experts of international law we were cooperating very closely in order to tell the world that this project of Kosovo liberation, this project of Kosovo's independence, it's not something, something crazy and unilaterally just because some, some, some people is wanting something extraordinary. It is the history itself in the happening. Yeah? And uh, that's why I thought that these two stages were very important. This first in 1999, when the world came together, democratic world especially, came together in order to say, this is the red line. You know, killing families, killing innocent people while staying in their home, killing children. It's, it's forbidden and we will act even if there are some dilemmas in international law. You know, because it's, it's human rights. It's a right of the people to live in their homes and freely. So this is, was a very nice and very good, very good consensus. And it, this was the first step. And the second step was in year 2000, 2008 and 2010. So in these two moments of history, of European history, it, during the 90s, it was very important, like... <coughs> You know, from um, politicians of Austria at that time to the leaders of Euro impo Im important leaders of European state came together and they decided something which was very important for the region and gave a very brave but a clear path forward. So, I will conclude here just by putting this thesis that our third step is missing. <laughs> this, this our third step is missing. I don't see it in horizon, but I am not pessimistic. So in my nature is, as you were saying in the beginning <laughs> of your speech, that we should stay optimistic all the time. But my worry is that I, st I still do not see in this European leadership still a clear unification in putting some stationary, some stationary points. Like all of this process, all of these remaining open issues, we have the vision that they should be solved like this. And to give a project which is from A to Z, like all of the and this was the, the really how they conceived the independence of Kosovo in 2008. Because they thought that, okay, you have a contest, you know, Kosovo and Serbia. Kosovo is not recognized in Serbia, and there are negotiations. But they cannot. And President Bush, United States President, said at the end of the process that this cannot be a never-ending process. It should be stopped, and Kosovo can can then go freely in the you know declaration of independence but also european european leaders european leaders were much more in that framework and sometimes we and and i see the the debates in european union and even in brussels when they happen they forget one important thing they forget that all of this process was under the auspices of united nations yeah Mr. Atisari, he was mandated by United Nations. He was representing United Nations. So the, the so the, uh, he was obliged to bring a solution in the name of United Nations. So his, his because after, after 14 years, I, I, I understand that sometimes European 
officials there in Brussels, uh, they, forgot, they forget sometimes how things happen. But this was really under United Nations. And second one, the, the ICJ. The ICJ is the court of United Nations. This court clarifies things between the open and contested things between United Nations members. So ICJ gave the opinion on legality of the independence of Kosovo. After these two moments, that uh, Mr. Ratisari, in the name of UNOSEC office, which was office of United Nations, gave the, the right and clear uh, answer that independence, supervised independence, should be the solution for this contest between Serbia and Kosovo. And the second, that Serbia and the complaint of Serbia got an, an, an answer into the ICJ, which is also the court of United Nations, I thought that this was the moment when international community should, should be more, more careful, more careful in the, you know, in this process of negotiations like, okay, but, you know, they can, they can go like this forever, you know, we ask parties what they think. Yes, but Mr. Vucic is not agree. Kosovo has the opposite positioning. And this is a kind of, um, you know, it's um, just asking parties and try to find desperately the common denominator between parties. There is no vision. There is no vision in this. There is just asking party, what do you think? And never ending process. So we need this third stage, I think. We need it. We don't see it still. But let's hope that one day we will have it, this one. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Before coming to the next step, maybe we sh should still stay with the first two steps. Uh, it's very interesting but that you mentioned these two steps. First of all, the question of um, international uh, engagement by force against the use of force by Serbia. Uh, which of course is still contested because it was not legalized by the United Nations, but United Nations was blocked. So for me it's convincing that you have to do something to stop the killing, if you call it genocide or the massacres, and there were mass killings uh, in Kosovo. So this is interesting because uh, we see with Ukraine a similar debates, not the same thing, but there are some similarities an aggression from the outside, um, and um, no UN activity to stop the aggression. Uh, the second point, and uh, I want to come back to this uh, second stage you mentioned, the, the international uh, court decision. We had here in this room very recently a discussion with uh, representatives from Catalonia, from Spain. And of course, they argued uh, also for independence or at least, you know, for a wide autonomy. But some, let's take the extreme form, is independence. So what, according to your opinion, and it's not only this is one of the reasons why Spain is still, unfortunately, not recognizing the independence of uh, Kosovo, or Kosovo. So what is the difference? What is, according to your opinion, makes it clear that in the case of Kosovo, there's a clear case for independence recognized by international court. But what makes it a difference to the case of Catalonia, of Scotland, other regions or other areas? Cyprus, if you think about the Turkish part of Cyprus. Because probably you have been asked quite often on this issue, but what, what makes the difference? But this is a tricky question. <laughs> Because you have to, you know, what you deserve that you deny to others, and this is a very, you know, complicated, complicated uh, discussion on what is your points that you are of demarcation that you are putting between the, the legality of your cause and the others. But I will try to just to make some important points in order to just uh, understand this, the differences. First one is I think that. Um, Everybody knows 
from these, you know, our law professors and experts in international relations and international law also. But also, you can find this argument in many of the delegations, of the state delegations into the, uh, and their judges into this um, ICJ, ICJ, that uh, argued in favor of Kosovo's independence, this argument, that Kosovo, among other arguments, the most important is that it can also be interpreted, it can also be interpreted into this category of the cutting the existing rights, yeah? which is like, which is like very well known argument in international, in international relations. So, when you have a certain, certain collective rights, yeah, and you cultivate that, and this set of rights, and that existing institutional and social condition is within your will as a people, and you want to advance it, the advancement is pretty much very very normal yeah you advance your right but to cut it to cut it is very dramatic and it's very forbidden in international relations and this is what was happening in Kosovo with the coming of Milosevic into power in 1989 so we were constitutive part of Yugoslavia and you could not change the status of Kosovo without the will of the people uh, of the institution, they cut it. So this cut, this unilateral cut, uh, let's say incited, incited uh, one chain of reactions, one chain of reactions, which I think that they have dramatic consequences in whole Yugoslavia, in whole Yugoslavia. Because then Slovenia and Croatia, in the beginning of the 90s, they saw that this regime of Milosevic was trying to suffocate this federation, this federation, and they thought that it's either you should subordinate to Serbia living together in the federation, or you have the war once you want to take your independent path. And it was happening in practice. It was showed by Milosevic that you have two options. Independence, and you will face war, or staying in Yugoslavia and being subordinated to, to Serbia. And to this was, this, you know, this um, presidium of Yugoslavia was pretty much dominated by you know, Milosevic and Serbian guys. But also army and, and other state security, intelligence and... Um, uh, other uh, important institutions. So, that's why after Kosovo, Kosovo was like the first element that made the big picture much more clear of this, what is this, what we called Yugoslavia. And then, that's why I think that it was very important because uh, Milosevic was saying that I am not turning back anymore. Like, it, it entered into the apartheid stage which was 1990, 1998, and then eight years after, you know, it started atrocities in the uh, unprotected civilians. That's why I think that this is very much important because, uh, because sometimes you do not see this argument anywhere else in the world. Like, you had a, a, a very strong consolidated autonomy, autonomy within a structure so, when you see from the legal point of view of international law, the competences that Kosovo enjoyed within this federation, which were much stronger than the subordination it has within the Republic of Serbia. Yeah? And this principle was very important. Why? Because it showed that it's a kind of an increase in the status towards a full republic. But when you intervene brutally to cut this from the near to republic to the, you know, simple province of cutting all of the competences like 
even firing people from their working places. You know, this is how you can allow this. You know. This is, is was very important. The second one, the second argument was this. And you, the, the first argument, you, you could find it also in the justification of many of the opinions of the states that they submitted in ICJ. And the second is much more, it has to do with what I called this kind of remedial self-determination. You have self-determination because you were damaged. You were damaged up to the bone, how, how they say it. It's, you were damaged in the fundamentals of your constitution as a people, as a collectivity. And we were damaged like this by, by Milosevic regime and by Serbian uh, state institutions. Because during apartheid, I remember, I belonged to the generations, I was not allowed to go to school. So I'm speaking as a witness here. I had 14, I was 14 years old, when I went to secondary school, we were improvising our homes, turning it into the schools, yeah? Be because Milosevic was, was forbidding us to, to go to the schools. Can you imagine into this, in the middle of Europe, preventing people to go to school with force and violence? So this was apartheid, but I think that the apartheid of Serbia in 1990-1998 was the most extreme version of, of apartheid. So it was very much spread violence of police. You know, they were just stopping you. Give me your, your ID card, please. You know, they were, they ca could beat you. And h cases like this were hundreds of thousands. Yeah? Like maybe 200 to 300,000 people went through th this procedure. You know, police stopping you, mistreating you, beating you, just because of your ethnic belonging. Yeah? It was, so it was a kind of a most extreme, most extreme version of the apartheid. And then when, when killing started, with, with, with tanks, with police entering into the houses, you know, at doing massacres into the families, like the biggest of the massacres is Maya massacre in Jakova, where, you know, Catholic, Catholic Albanians together with Muslim Albanians, they were massacred both. The same in Maya, you have 377 <coughs> citizens massacred just in that village, and then Krusha in Rahovets 243, and then Krusha Vogel 112. But you have around three or 300 atrocities like this. So four, five, two, 377. You have 300 this kind of massi massive atrocities. And then enough was enough to international community and they uh, reacted. So, you could not turn back, yeah? You could not turn back. You have to, when you have this situation, when international community also intervene, and this is the third argument, so international arg community intervene. You cannot turn back the, the situation. And the only thing was to to see and to ask people what do they think, how do they, and the will of, majority of the will of the people was that we have to proceed it in our own way, in independence, and, in, and this is really what was happening. Thank you very much. Now, looking into the future, what, uh, I think in the second part we will discuss about uh, what the European Union should do, but uh, out of your experience and looking into the history and the mistreatment, how do you envisage a society in Kosovo where Albanians and Serbs and some other groups are living together? Where are the blockades? Where are the, the problems, the issues that this living together is perhaps not yet as, as well? Maybe you can differentiate it between the region south of the Iba is it, is it, as it's very often said, peaceful and everything is okay? And how is it north of Iba, north of Mitrovica? And how could a basis be created 
for a common society of all uh, people living in, Al in, in Albania or where do you see any, any issues and problems still to be solved? You could also, of course, uh, make some reference perhaps to some of the promises given, for example, this federation of uh, mun municipalities, which your, your government, if I may say so, is very hesitant uh, or is opposing. So maybe you can a bit describe what should be done or what should not be done to create a multi-ethnic society in Kosovo or Kosovo. Yeah, on this issue, I think that um, if you have to live some years with us there, down there in Kosovo, and if you know very well the cost of our society, like you know our mindset and how we think and how we behave and, and everything, you, know, you cannot but you cannot but notice that that there is no substantial hate, substantial hate between you know people according to the ethnic belonging ethnic belonging. So, I myself do not have any problem to have a Serbian, let's say, friend and, uh, you know, to speak with him, to have a drink with him, to, you know, to cooperate with him and to see as a, you know, as a respectful and very equal citizen of the society we we share together, huh? we share together. So uh, I always think, and everybody agrees on this pretty much, that all of the contradictions, all of the tensions that were coming and pushing people against, let's say pushing even the Serbs against my, my, my people, against like our society was and you know coming there from Serbia as a soldiers and killing in, into another another country was this top down politics yeah top down politics from up to the bottom you know this whole machinery of different parts of state totally involved into a creation of the perception of what I am uh, as, as Albanian living in Kosovo. This was done for decades and decades. And this was done with the state institutions, with media captured by, by state institutions, by academia, which contributed pretty much in this perception. And also the church was not innocent <laughs> in all of this. Yeah? So these this four fundamental machineries were composing this system of creating and indoctrinating people that for them was, was very easy, very easy to go there and, and to, kill, to kill children without, you know, without having consciousness and being inside the ethics of what you're doing you know can you have a reflection on what you're doing you know because wh when they did some these these terrible acts and they they were pretty much thinking that they are doing very important for their nation so they beha be their behavior was pretty much conditioned by a machinery which uh, sustains sustains all of this perceptions which has uh, fundamental consequences in your behavior as a human being so i i always put put my my let's say my my emphasize my emphasize on this on these dimensions especially because without that without that you could not have this kind of behavior and this is my worrying because my worrying is that the president of serbia comes from these kind of circles. Maybe from the perception of Brussels, he changed a lot. 
at least I hear this from some European leaders, you know. But from from the perception of us who suffered all of this, what Serbia was doing, it it is still within that framework, still within that old framework of uh, yeah creating this perception that Albanians have stolen Kosovo from us, yeah. Albanians as this remnant of Ottoman Empire. They have stolen Kosovo from us and Kosovo is the heart of our land and we have to defend it at every cost. Yeah, but look what cost is this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's keeping the Balkans still a hostage. A hostage. A hostage which is much more endangered, especially after Russian invasion. And so that's why I think that uh, we must find resources and, and, and forces to overcome this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, perception in which Mr. Vucic was stuck. Yeah, to, to overcome somehow. If he overcomes this, the recognition is just to accept something which has no cost at all. It's just accepting reality. You know, accepting a, rea a reality is not a cost. It's a benefit, I think. <laughs> it's a benefit for all. You know. mentioned President Vucic. Do you fear that the uh, underlining by the West of the integrity of Ukraine, of whole Ukraine, can be used by Mr. Vucic to go back and say, look, now we have to uh, underline also the integrity of Serbia, and as you said, Kosovo is part of Serbia, so will it be stiffening his position? Uh, or do you think, on the other hand, that if there's some compromise in Ukraine, that he must accept the independence uh, of uh, Kosovo, because if let's say some part of Ukraine is more or less semi-autonomous or is swallowed by Russia, uh, his, uh, his friends, Mr. Putin, uh, that he has to accept at the end that the independence of Kosovo is a fact and he has to recognize it. In uh, how Russia behaves in international relations, uh, Kosovo is not a substantial part of, of the actions of the Russian Federation. It's always an, uh, as an excuse. So, what it, it, you always have to pose the question, what if would have not happening, this kind of, of course, nothing would have changed in Russian, you know, approach and all of this. Because Russia thinks with this aggression that they are following their most of substantial interest, their national interest, how they defined it. It's a tragedy for the world that they are defining this, their interest this way, that they are doing. But Kosovo is always as an excuse. You know, you have to mention it always in order to achieve your, like, your interest. Yeah? And if the reality changes, your approach does not change. You still continue, but you find another excuse then. But for Mr. Vucic? How does it change from yeah, Mr. Vucic? for Mr. Vucic? For Mr. Vucic, it has also it has also some consequences because they thought he always thought that he is in a, let's say in a congruence and in agreement with a legal form of that argument. Yeah, so it's it's Ukraine, it's Kosovo, you know. Either or, you know, but now they are putting in the same dimensions the two, both of them. <laughs> so for Mr. Vucic, this would be something which he likes to call it, I am now in difficult situation <laughs> because of this, because of this, what is happening. But in his behavior, in his behavior, he is, uh, if you could see the, his agreement, he was reaching for a uh, gas supply from Russia last week. He was, you know, presenting this agreement as the best 
you know, Serbia could get with the best prices of the gas in Europe. You know, they were, Mr. Vucic still is trying to stay very, very close and linked with Russia. But, um, so I think that Serbia's approach is to condemn Russian aggression in declarations and resolutions, but not coming after and being aligned with European Union packages of sanctions. So no sh sanctions, but condemnations and maybe voting such as was the voting in United Nations on resolution about condemning Russian aggression. So I think that they will, this will be their, their behavior and strategy. Okay, I think we should come uh, to the last question. But before I go to the last question about uh, what you expect from European Union, what European should do, I would just ask if there is any question here, because, uh, yes, we have one, two, three. Okay, please. <laughs> okay. Um, Kosovo is usually known for its moderate and tolerant Islam. In the last 20 years, however, the political vacuum and the horrendous corruption and poverty, uh, especially in rural areas in Kosovo, have meant that especially Saudi Arabian missionaries have had enough space uh, to promote the radical Wahhabi interpretation of uh, Islam. And since then, there has been a constant increase in radical m Muslims in Kosovo, which is one of the primary concer concerns in Kosovo. And uh, the one of the primary concerns rests with this potential of uh, breeding a variant of political Islam uh, that would contest the liberal uh, democratic norms and values associated with EU accession. Um, and it's being said that this uh, development is progressing slowly and silently and many citizens are concerned that uh, Vedvendosia is too open for Islamists or, you know, radical Islam. What is your stance on that issue and that of the Vedvendosia? I think that um, this re religious radicalization is a global is a global process, and it uh, it happens unfortunately in every in every state in every state of the of the world. And the most extreme version of this phenomena we experienced with a, you know, this ISIS project, this ISIS state, which they tried to implement it in Syria and in some other parts also, which uh, was facing the response of the democratic world in order to not allow this happening. But uh, in Kosovo, I think that political Islam is uh, weak, is weak, even though we have to be always uh, vigilant and to to see how it develops, because I say it is weak just because of one reason. They tried three times to pass the electoral threshold in Kosovo, and they could not reach that. So it was presented as an Islamic political movement and all of this. They could not reach even the 3% of the, you know, it, they were taking less than 1%, always. So this is also one indication and one argument I am giving to you, denying your, your pretensions, you read, that this is a, one of the hugest, dangerous, you know, coming in Kosovo. I don't think that we have to see it that way. Second is that I don't think that Vendosia has any kind of, uh, let's say, um, cooperation with uh, with all of these officials or politicians that might be put into this category of um, fundamentalists yeah islamic fundamentalists i don't know where you took this kind of um, 
you know, conclusion, but it is false. <laughs> it is false because I think that um, that Vendosia has proven as a political party that it belongs to pretty much this mainstream national, yeah, national parties for which maybe, you know, this national belonging is the most important, is the most important, but also to this very liberal civic human rights. I put Vedendosia into these two dimensions. So the dimension of, but not, I would not say nationalism, like this nationalism of denying the others the right to live together and to, this much more, this defense, defense mechanisms of your nations being endangered, endangered by genocide and by brutal violence that we experience. Yes, of course, you have to, and it, it, it becomes naturally a kind of a stronger feeling of your national identity. It's very understandable from this perspective. But also from this, also the other dimension of, uh, yeah, very liberal in, in human rights because of social democracy we are representing as a political party. But uh, if you see that our government was bringing civil code, civil code in the parliament, we tried to vote it and it was the government vision. There inside you have regulated also, you know, LGBT rights and other things. Then how could you say that we are, <laughs> no, <I'm not laughs> as a political party, you know, many many experts in, including um, Gellner who is a huge sociologist one of the biggest sociologists of the 20th century said that you know I read his book on nation and it's very important he opens his book by this probable sentence. I cannot, I'm not sure if I'm citing it, all of this, but he said that during the whole 20th century, in all of other uh, religions, you have, you can notice, and also by studying, a drop in influence, except one exception, which is Islam, which is increasing its influence. So it's global, I think. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, you know, Kosovo as a tiny, you know, state which, in which this phenomena is happening. You know, it's, if you see the 20th century, but also 21st, you see a kind of a increase in this political Islam, yeah? And Kosovo cannot be, cannot be outside of this global landscape, but I would not say that it's, uh, you know, it's a front line of, let's say, it's a front line of, of this phenomena. I don't think. Yeah, very quickly and very shortly. Um, thank you so much. And one of the biggest problems in the region and also for Kosovo is that so many young people are leaving the region because they are lacking perspective. And so I think this is one of the biggest challenges, I think, also for um, Kosovo and the government and the region. So my question would be, what can you offer the young um, people in the region, in Kosovo, that they feel they have a perspective and that they don't want to leave the country. And I think this is crucially important, not only for now, but especially when it comes to the future. And I think that European Union accession alone cannot be the answer to that. Thank you. Yeah, very, 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 yeah. Yeah, very important issue you raised. When I was born in uh, 1981, um, the census was that year when uh, when I was born in Kosovo, <laughs> Kosovo under Yugoslavia, and 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 uh, the census proved that Kosovo had around two million two million inhabitants. In the census of 2012, 1.7 million were officially. So, 30 years after, with the highest birth rate in Europe, you have 300,000 citizens less than in 81. 
than in year 81. This is really, really, I would say tragic, tragic, traumatic for, for a country, yeah? So this is what we are facing, actually. And this is, it, it has become chronic, chronic phenomena for, for my, my people. And, and of course, but what was mo much more traumatic was that we thought that it is happening just because of apartheid is, it was happening in during the 90s because 300 people lived Kosovo during that time, just during the 90s, mainly in Switzerland and Germany. Our hugest diaspora is, lives there. But now when you see that after independence people are living also, then you have to, you know, to think and reflect what is happening, you know, what and because now it's the emigration of, of economic, economic emigration. You know, it's not because of, of violence, because their state is theirs, we achieve what we wanted, but now it's the economic pressure. And so what can we do? We can do many things, and it starts with three. I think that people when they have three things which are good and functioning good functioning properly i think that uh, yeah they 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 want to live in their in their country first is justice justice to have their inside to have their feeling that justice is happening you can live here but not you know, if something happens to your family, to your to your friends, to your somebody who knows, and he cannot consume justice within his own state, he feels like totally worthless, living in that state and in that. Second is, second is uh, uh, healthcare system. If 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 you you face healthcare system. You go to take a service into the health care, and you're disappointing, you're disappointing. Then we have this phenomena when, you know, for, for many and many years, these uh, guys who are young parents, young parents with small children, the small children, they had a kind of pressure to, 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 to leave. In, in order to, to find to find somehow a, b a better life and, and you know. so because people they don't uh, they don't leave they never leave just because they wish you know I have some fantasies you know because of fantasies I, I you know some countries are better I want to go there just for a lifestyle yeah they they leave because of the pressure and there were some pressures and the third one is this perspective, economic perspective after you finish education. You know, this last cycle of, you know, this stage of usual education, which is like faculty and, you know, higher education. You finish higher education, you wait that you, you, you will have some good perspective, some find a good working place. It was never the case in Kosovo, like during the last years. And it is still, I see, it's not easy to change, yeah? It's not easy to change. You cannot change it within one year, yeah, of the, of the new government. And it is still, you know, people are... But I think that optimism is much higher now. We, we could see it also in the growth. We experienced it last year. It was more than 9%. It is in people's, yeah... Um, Tax collection is tax collection is much higher, and it's coming with the trust of the citizens into the institutions, because they don't think that why when they think that corruption is fighting, you know they they give to the state much more, and they are much much more disciplined into this you know their obligations, their taxes that they have to pay to the to the state. So all of these phenomena we see, and this is a good sign, but still we need some structural changes. And the most important thing 
we have to do is to the reforms in education. Education, we see that how our education system of education is constructed is totally outside of the economic needs of 21st century. And when PISA test is, is happening in Kosovo, like with children, with pupils, with pupils to see how their function, how, how their, their logic is functioning, they see two very concerning shortcomings in our, uh, the mindset of our pupils. The effectivity of the operation with symbols is very high, very low, very low. They don't know how very well to operate with the uh, symbols, so with abstract signs, with abstract signs. And you can then uh, understand that why in mathematics they are not so well doing. You know, and so with mathematics goes then the, you know, uh, technology uh, of information and, and all of this because it 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 is all has to do with the uh, languages. Even the you know computers and machines are working with their own languages. You have to learn languages, and languages are constructed by how well you are performing in using symbols and abstract signs. So in our education system, this dimension is still weak, very weak, I, I would say. And the second one is that also language. To strengthen the capacity of, of, of uh, language. Yeah, because, because um, uh, pupils, pupils the, the, the percentage of um, understanding of, uh, you know, a little bit of difficulty of the text they are reading is not the same as in European level, the average. So, the, and, they, and the discover was really terrible, I would say, by the PISA test, because, uh, because they, they, they uh, discovered that uh, if you compare, if you compare this, um, all of the abilities, with the symbols and with the languages, the average of one 14 years pupil of Kosovo is the equals of the 10 year of European Union. So this is a this is a pretty much of discrepancy. This is a high high years of discrepancy between our our our, our pupils and, and European Union's pupils average. I'm talking. So this is, that's why I think that we have to invest much more in education in order to, to invest in young and in pupils uh, the, the skills, the intellectual skills that are compatible with the markets and economy of 21st century. So, um, thank you very much for, for being our guest panelist here at the Institute. My name is Luka Cekic. I'm from Serbia, from Belgrade. I work currently here as a project assistant at the IAP, and I have a question. Um, <laughs> um, first of all, let's start with Srpska lista. Uh, Srpska lista, because I'm really interested in this. Uh, Srpska, Srpska lista is a part of the government or not? Is it in a coalition or not? I don't quite understand this. Undefined. It's undefined, okay. Um, first, of first of all this. Second of all, you talked a lot about history, awful things which were happening in history, and that's true. Everybody can acknowledge it. Um, I think that for a dialogue, especially between Serbia and Kosovo, or from Belgrade, Pristina, however you want to call it, it's really important that both sides leave the past behind, if they can, and I think it's possible, and reach out with a hand to solve the problems. Because what we are seeing right now for the last 20 years, let's say from 1999 until today, is that both sides are blaming each other and throwing stones at each other without giving, how can I say, the dialogue a real chance or a real opportunity. For an example, there was this belgrade pristina dialogue. It stalled. So maybe from your view, from Kosovo, because I, I really want to hear your opinion about this, how do you plan to, to contribute as Kosovars to the reconciliation process, to the 
let's say, the, the getting back to the normal life. Because I cannot say that also in Serbia or in Kosovo, unless the problem is solved, there will never be normal life. And it's a problem that covers us both. Never mind that I'm from Serbia or you're from Kosovo. It, it's, 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 a, it's a problem for both of us. So maybe if you can reach upon that a bit. So yes, and, and yeah. maybe as, as time is also proceeding with this, uh, would be your your final words or your conclusion because I think this is the big issue, politically the big issue. What what you said also is is true, but I think uh, yeah, maybe you also can conclude your your talk with answering this question. I, I, uh, to, to be honest, I I don't think that uh, everything bad comes from the principle of sticking with the past. I, I, I much more I think that the problem comes when they are two different pasts. <laughs> so it's, it's when the contr fundamental contradiction emerges from the perception of the past. And then this, this produces some, some, very, some very complicated, you know, difficulties and situations because if you see like like the the leadership like of Kosovo, I just compare it with Serbia. And with, could you imagine just a situation when there will be in Serbia a prime minister which has the same same perception as me on what really happened? Let's take for instance Chedomir Jovanovic. Like Chedomir Jovanovic, uh, he's a Serbian like you, but he thinks that. You know, Serbia was wrong in, in, into that. Yeah, the, the atrocities, the, they, it was wrong. So, he thinks that Serbia was not defi defending a national interest. It, it was misdeeds that, that Serbia did in the, through Milosevic. So, uh, so uh, I, I don't think that, that the, that's why I don't think that the problem, the problem is per se between Albanians and Serbs. You see, <laughs> because I know Mr. Kandic, you know yeah. Natasha Kandic. She visited me recently. I, I, I invited her in our, in our in our parliament, and she is a very respected lady. And but but she has the courage that many Serbian leadership lacks, of you know, uh, coming very close to our perception of what really happened, yeah? So, so when, when you do things like that, I don't think that, that, that the bad thing comes especially from that dimension. But we have to work uh, closely, and I, I think that, you know, there are many intellectuals in Serbia doing that thing. Mr. Chanak visited Kosovo recently, and he went, purposefully, he went to Meja massacre. Mr. Chanak is one of the well-known uh, politicians of Serbia. You know, he is doing uh, great things, and he went there, and he so he saw what what was happening, really. You know, and and so if if, if from this standpoint, if you accept it, I think it's a kind of catharsis, really. It's a kind of a catharsis when you really understand what what really was happening, and this this. Transforms your your transforms your mindset in, in a way. So that's why I think that um, this is precisely the point when we were stuck, <laughs> because uh, because in Serbia, like even when Tadic and you know some some politicians who call themselves very democratic, like Tadic and there were some others like. Borko Stefanovic and some, some others, now they are in opposition fighting with Vucic and with... They always, always thought that accepting this reality and thinking same as we do think, I'm not talking about the legality of independence of Kosovo, just about what was happening, you know, at the precise time on the April 1999. The most massacres concentrated happened during this month, April 1999. So uh, then uh, you feel uh, you feel you have problems because uh, you start to to think if we cannot have a common 
a common perception on these kind of events which were the most terrified real events happened ever in our region, also in Bosnia, I'm not excluding that, but also in Kosovo, how can we, how, how can we agree on some much more complicated facts and situation on the truth, what the truth is? You know? and, and because of this, I think that, uh, I think that that's why I'm a bit pessimistic. Because it's not that for the sake of reaching an agreement, let's, we, we can reach it like a technical agreement also, not mentioning the past. But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I don't think that this is the right dimension to, ex to explain the real conditions of the problem we have. <laughs> so this is my, my approach. And according to the Lista Srpska uh, question, I was deputy, deputy president of Parliament of Kosovo 12 years before. There was no Lista Srpska at that time. Yeah? I knew a very good guy. His name was Petar Miletic. He was from... Uh, he was from, uh, I think he was from Zvechan, I think, yeah. He was my colleague, he was vice president also. We were together vice president. I, I, I talked with him. I had many travelings with him. He had no fundamental, fundamental op op oppose to the, to the independence of Kosovo. Like, he thought that he's citizen of Kosovo, he lived there. His father was born there. His grandfather was born. His everybody of him was living in Kosovo, and he he said that I want to live in this state. I have to take the passport of Kosovo, everything, you know, documents accepting the state. Uh, so I I thought that he was, but he was representing this uh, uh, liberal stranka, this uh, liberal stranka uh, party. Yeah, yeah, liberal party of, and. Many, many of the politicians were like this during 2008, 2012, for four years. Then Vucic came, and he destroyed all of this political party. He invented this Lista Srpska, which first goes with a meeting with Vucic, takes instructions, and comes in the parliament of Kosovo. That's very problematic, I, I would say, how th they behave, you know, <laughs> in order to reach and, and you know, cooperation and close to first you have to settle down with yourself settling down with yourself is that you live in a country which declared independence you cannot deny that like I want to, to just deny that and I want to live in a parallel non-existing world or state of course you can go to Serbia you can speak your language everything, your schools, your books your culture, your identity nobody touches that yeah but it's just that you have to come to terms with with reality and with now he produced these kind of guys in in serbian lista who you know the the first thing when independence is mentioned on they are they became very aggressive and they very rigid not cooperating and not which is i think which damaged damaged some some achievements some achievements that even I myself experienced during the be in the beginning when I became MP in 2010. I had this colleague Petar Miletic. You know, I was talking with him like with a guy with no problems. With uh, you know, but you cannot talk with a Lista Srpska anymore like that because <laughs> you know once you say to them that okay we go together with one activity, they just set aside and they don't want to take nothing that within Kosovo's institutions and independence and and I think that it's it's just if you want to complicate things further it you behave like this and really we are in this situation that but never lose the never lose the optimism that one day you know all of this region will become like no problems with each other you know as a free free people of this democratic world 
Okay, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, we should close with these uh, very optimistic words. Of course, reconciliation is a very long process, especially if uh, it is not enforced on you because you have been totally destroyed, like it was with Nazi Germany. So it was easier then uh, than it is today, but nevertheless, I think we should not give up hope. I think it was a very interesting uh, discussion and presentation from, from your point of view, and uh, I think um, as Austria recognized Kosovo from the very beginning, and I always uh, underlined this uh, because it is justified by all what happened, even the small things I could see visiting Kosovo uh, was very clear going into that direction that we need, and I hope that the those member countries of the European Union who are still not recognized will do very soon and I hope that the uh, European Union with all the war in Ukraine will not forget the region of the Western Balkans but in the country invest even more financially but also politically and that includes of course Kosovo, one of the uh, new states in, in this region with a long history, uh, not always a good history as we know but uh, with a very important future. Thank you very much for coming and uh, for your presentation and good luck to you personally. Thank you very much.